Welcome to Kingdom Promoters TV Network. My name is Minister Fatike Samora. I want to take this time to welcome you once more to our TV network. As usual, I take the time to appreciate you all for watching, liking, and subscribing, and also sharing our programs here on KPTV Network. If you're watching us for the first time, welcome. And please let us know where you're watching from and how the show or this ministry has been a blessing to you and your family. Before I start talking about what I'm here to teach on today, I want to just give some brief um, new things that we're going to do here on KPTV Network. Starting next week, by God's grace, next week Sunday, um, we have partnered with Gideon Mission TV in Nigeria. And they are a wonderful ministry that God is using to bring the gospel through drama. And by God's grace, a lot of, life, a lot of lives are being touched and a lot of souls are being won for the kingdom of God and salvation has been um, the paramount mission and vision of this ministry and the man of God in Nigeria, Pastor Bajo is um, the founder and his beautiful wife with this ministry, you can find them on Facebook and subscribe to their YouTube channel as well, it's called Gideon Mission Television or Gideon Mission TV they um they are more focused on um gospel drama they literally bring the the word of god alive and please look forward to this new development with kptv network we're partnering with them and by god's grace we pray that every movie that comes out on this network on sundays starting next week will be a blessing to you and also will be a teaching experience for you the viewer and your family and um most importantly, last week I was going to come on, but for some reason I um, was not really led to do or preach anything last week. But there is something that I want to share with everyone that I've, I've seen the Lord showed me. And as I said before, when there's a vision that is being shown, especially when you are just being given the opportunity to stand and watch and observe, that means it's not about you. It's about the people. It's about the church is about the body of Christ. So I'm here to just share what the Lord showed me um, last week, Thursday. And there was a meeting that is being called in this mission, in this vision. There was a great gathering of men and women of God from all over the world. I mean, I saw pastors who are like famous and pastors who are not even known. You know, they were coming from every direction, east, west, north and south. They were coming together in this particular building it was like a big like a staple center kind of building they were gathering they were gathering for a meeting and a, like, there was a conference going on for these pastors and at first i wasn't sure you know what this was about and then i i it, it dawned in my spirit man that there's a pastor that there are gathering happening for pastors all around the world and nobody in the congregation nobody in the meeting Nobody among these pastors called this meeting. Nobody called this gathering. Nobody from this conference. There was no host. There was no organizer. But they were just coming. And they know that they were coming for a meeting. They know they were coming for a conference. So while they were coming and I stand, I stood there in the, in the building watching them. And I saw one famous pastor, Ben and Hin, was running into the building. He was running towards the building so he would not be late for this meeting. And I stood there in my spirit. I was like, God, who called this meeting? Why are these pastors coming from every part of the world? In Africa, white, black, Asian, they were all there. There were women there who were pastors. And I felt the impression in my spirit. It was God that is calling this meeting for with these pastors. God is calling the meeting with these pastors. And then I found myself outside and I'm observing the surrounding of the building. And there were a lot of people outside as well. A lot of people surrounding this building. But then I, I came to understand in the dream that those people outside are, are church members of these pastors. They are members of these pastors. But none of the members are allowed to enter into this building where their pastors are being held for this meeting. And also they were family members of these pastors who were also outside, in this, outside the building. And also you have people who are just sitting there spectators to see what is happening. And next thing you know, there were cameras, news, news reporters. 
that have heard about this great meeting, but even they themselves have no clue about what this meeting is about and who called this meeting. So I woke up from that dream and I prayed and I asked God, what could this mean? So I really didn't have any further um, information. I didn't have any further explanation, but I, I, I know I, 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 I gathered this information from the dream that when the meeting was called, um, God himself called them together. And then the, the church members were not even allowed to participate or be in the building at all. It was just every pastor from every walks of life. And also the family members were not there. So this is my encouragement to you as men of God and women of God. That in this season, whatever is happening right now, it's, it's bad, it's awful. But I want us to, um, I want to encourage you all to, to be faithful, to be faithful. To be faithful because at the end of the day, you are going to give an account for your own life. And you're going to give an account for the members that God has gave you. And you're going to give an account for your household. So that's, for me, that's what I realized. Like these pastors were not even, the, their members and their family members were not even allowed in the building. It was just a meeting between them and God himself. Him, them and God alone. So this mission and this work, this ministry, this, this road and journey that we are on, it's a personal thing. It's a personal thing between you and God. So whatever you're doing in the secret place, make sure your motives are right. Make sure that God is in it. Make sure that you seek the face of God in whatever you are doing. And ask the Lord, Father, whatever you're doing in this season, as a pastor, as a bishop, as a prophet, or whatever, position the office you called yourself i i pray that you ask god to position you so that you will not miss what god is trying to do so you will not miss what god is um doing in this season amen so may god bless you all pastors and and prophets and men and women of god that um right now it's not easy but you're doing everything you can to be able to reach your sh your your ships and and be able to uh, encourage them I know it's it's difficult, but just stay in there and, and be steadfast and trust God because God is going to work everything out for your good. So with that being said, today's teaching is going to be about things that we have to apply in our life, things that we can do that makes that that bring us to that place of enjoying the promises of God. I know there are times when you walk around as a Christian, you know, you say to yourself, How come I am doing this? But it seems like it's not working. I am, I'm praying and I'm fasting, but things are still not working, you know. But, you know, at the end of the day, one thing always remains the same. Jesus Christ is, he is who he said he is. And the word of God never lies. You understand? The word of God is stands. The word of God never changes. And God made it clear that the word of God is, 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 is food to our soul. We have to devour it. We have to eat it. He said, read this, meditate on it. Don't let it depart from you. So for us to be able to, to walk and experience the premises of God and enjoy the premises of God, we have to start practicing some of these things. You know, and as a Christian, if you know your life is not changing, it's not going anywhere, things are not working out, maybe you're just not doing these things. So I am here today to teach and talk on what are the things, just not all of them, but some of the things that even Jesus himself taught and, 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 and gave us advice as of what to do and how to do it and why we should do it you understand so that's what i'm teaching on today so i pray that the word of god comes today it be a, be a blessing to you in jesus name without no further delay let's go straight into today's um today's discussion so what are the things i can do you, you to 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 be able to really attain or obtain that promise that God has given you as a child of God. You know, it's not only about confessing it. It's not only about reading it. It's not teaching it. It's about applying it. And most of all, believing it. So point number one, what can I do to be able to walk in the full step of Jesus Christ and attain, be able to maintain that blessing that God said in the book of Ephesians that it has already been given to me. 
the blessings, the spiritual blessings that God has already given unto me. What can I do to be able to attain that? What can I do to be able to maintain that? So point number one, obey. Obey the Lord and his word. The word of God is God. And God is the word of God. So you can't say, I obey God, but I don't obey the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And God is the word. So we have to be able to obey God. You know, sometimes it's very easy to, uh, for us to read the Bible, um, to be able to fill that gap of accomplishment as Christians that, okay, I have read the Bible today. Whew, check, I've put the checklist on, you know, but it, it, there's more to it. There's just more to just reading the Bible. There's just more to going to church every Sunday or Saturday or whatever day you go to church. There's just more to just confessing that I'm a child of God. So point number one, we must be in that place as children of God. We must obey the Lord and his word. But why should I obey God's word, you said? Okay, well, for a start, let me say this. We all know that the Bible said in the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, he says that the people perish because of lack of knowledge. When you don't know, you, you are constantly in ignorant. Ignorance is the biggest enemy to your life. When it comes to the word of God, ignorance is the biggest sin. Ignorance is the biggest stumbling block. Sometimes it's not even the devil. Though. Sometimes it's not even your uncle or your aunties or your neighbor. Sometimes it's yourself. Because of ignorance. My people perish for lack of knowledge. When you lack knowledge in life, you will never be able to go to the next level. The Bible said we have to study to show ourselves approved. Knowledge is power. When you know, it will help you. Life can be very difficult when you live in ignorance. Very, very difficult. So as Christians, if you want to fulfill your purpose here on earth, it is about high time that we start to obey God's word. It's very important for us to read the Bible, as I said. But it makes no sense for you to read the Bible and you don't believe it and then you don't obey it. It, of no, it is of no use. But by the time we start reading God's word, by the time we start reading God's word and applying it in our lives, then we start to see the fruit of what is written in that book concerning you and I, our lives. Well, you may be thinking, well, I read the Bible, I fasted. Again, there's nothing wrong because Jesus said we have to read the Bible day in and day out. Meditate on it. Don't let it depart from you. But when you're reading it, are you understanding what you're reading? Are you, do you believe in what you read? Do you apply what you're reading? Do you apply it? What are the benefits? What benefit is it to me when I read the Bible? Is it just maybe to show off? Am I just reading the Bible so I can just get knowledge to argue the next Christian? Or maybe to let other people know that I am biblically, biblically sound. So people will not look down on you and say, oh, this person, he knows the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He has finished reading the Bible. Every year he finished the Bible. I was watching one show with my daughter. It's called um, Wife Swipe or Family Wife Swipe, something like that. So this family went to another family in New Jersey. The, the husband was a theologian. He knows the Bible inside out. Okay. So my daughter and I were sitting watching this, this show. Because this man knew the Bible, the one that came in the house was a pagan. She's a satanist. She doesn't not believe in God and all that. You see, the man that knows the Bible only has Bible knowledge. But there's no spiritual insight. He doesn't have no relationship with God. So because of his biblical knowledge, he was not operating in a religious mindset. So because of that, he was not able to even lead this unbeliever that is under his roof. They were always in conflict, always fighting. At the end of the day, he ran out of his own house. You see, because his Bible knowledge was not able to save him. 
it's good to know the Bible, but when you're not applying the Bible and you don't know the importance and the power of the words that are in the Bible, it will just be as an asset to you, not a, 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 something that will benefit you. So it's very important. So when we read the Bible, we have to be also um, honor God's word. Okay? So let me tell you, if you don't obey, disobedience can prolong your destiny. Disobedient to the word of God and to God himself can prolong your destiny. Most of the time we are caught, you know, the problems that we face in life, honestly, is just self-inflicted problem. We ourselves, we are, we are the cause of our problems. Because why? God has given us this word. He said, here. Yeah. It's just like if you and I go and buy a, a Mercedes Benz or if we buy a Lexus car. Okay, and then now we drive out of that parking lot. That car has no manual. What are you going to do? You're going to take it back to the dealership. Listen, you sold me something that I don't know how to use. What if my light does not come on? Where do I go for, for, for resolution? Everything on this, in this earth has to have manual direction. Before, like maybe 20 years ago, people used to have um, maps for GPS direction to tell you where to go and guess what most times people get lost because when you're reading the instruction and you're not following the instruction it will take you to a different direction from where the map it's not that the map is wrong but you are reading it wrong and you are not reading it with understanding and when you read it to understand it you are not following it you want to put your own sabi sabi your own apply your own knowledge but the but map is saying go this way and you say you know, if I go this way, it might be shorter. And that's the thing that we do most of the time as Christians. We want to take the shorter route. We don't want to sit and read the Bible. But man, the, the, everything we need is inside this Bible. It's inside this Bible. Disobedience can prolong your destiny. Most of the time, it's our own problem. Because we choose to languish in ignorance. God's commandment has been given to us to, to, to work according to. Everything we need about this life and how to succeed in this world and what to do to attain that blessings that God has given us, it is already in the Bible. You understand? So, do not lean on your own understanding, but in everything, acknowledge the Lord. Honor Him. Obey Him. Obey Him. You may say, okay, I'm smart. I'm a well-educated person. I have master's degree. I have PhD. I have doctorate. And I'm successful. I, don't, I didn't read the Bible. I graduated at the top of my, my class in Cambridge University. Good. But my friend, let me tell you something. It is God who has given you that knowledge to be able to learn. There's going to come a time. There will be a time when you will need God in your life. And there's always be, there will always be that difference. The difference is clear. Educational knowledge without Christ, there will come a time when that void inside of you will need to be filled. And that's when you start your journey of finding God. Obey God. So now, what happens when we do not obey God's word or his voice? Okay. There are so many people in the Bible who disobeyed God and we saw the consequences of that, of that disobedience. One of the things that will happen to you as a Christian when you don't honor God's word you don't obey God's, the Lord and his word, you will not grow spiritually. Spiritual growth will never happen. I'm not talking about all that spiritual. I'm talking about the spirit of the Holy Spirit and the spirit of God in you. Spiritual growth will never happen. Maturity spiritually will never happen when you don't obey God's word. When you don't obey God himself, you will never grow. Number two, we, we will get stuck in the old ways of doing things. You understand? It's like we're just going around the mountain. Just going around the mountain. And ignorance will keep us going around that mountain. It's like you have this computer. Everything you want to know in this world, go in this computer. You understand? It will tell you everything you need to know. But then you have the computer, you're not making use of it, but then you need information that will 
help you to, pro to prosper and go forward. But the computer is just there. You're not using it. Every morning you dust it. You just dust it and put it down. It's just like the word of God. Your instructions is right there. The manual is right there how to live your life. But we choose to stay in ignorance. Ignorance will keep you going around the mountain. Number four. God will reject you. You will be rejected by God when you do not obey God and you are willfully disobeying Him and ignoring Him. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. When you continually walk in disobedience, God will reject you. You say, but how is that possible? God is a loving God. God is a merciful God. Yes, He's a merciful God, but... My brother, we have to respect it, obey him. Let's read the story of a very famous man in the Bible. Sometimes people will just talk about his story. You know, um, um, King Saul and David and all that. But let me read a story to you where um, God rejected Sam, um, King Saul because of disobedience. So we're going to read the book of First Kings chapter 15, no, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10 to 11 first. We're going to read verse 10 to 11 and then 22 to 23. And it says, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry. And he cried out to the Lord all night. Verse 12. And he says, Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet, to meet with Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone to Camel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor. Has turned, has turned and gone to, down to Gilal. Okay. So, let's go to verse 22, because of time. Verse 20. Here it says, now this is Samuel telling Saul what he has done wrong. God gave Saul an instruction to go and kill the Amalekites, but then he didn't do it. He went and did something completely different, opposite from what God did, disobedient. So, when, when prophet Samuel came and told him about the thing that he has done, that he has caused God to regret ever choosing him. Samuel said, verse 22. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To, be a, to, be, um, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than a fat ram. For rebellion is, 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 is like sin of divination. In another version, it said rebellion is a, is a sin of witchcraft. You understand? And arrogance like the evil of adultery. Because you have rejected the word of God. Because you have rejected the words of God. The Lord too has rejected you as a king. Do you understand? So God can reject us. When we reject his word. When we reject his following him. Now. What the reason. For disobedient. You say okay. But you don't understand. Woman of God, it's not easy to obey God. How can you obey somebody that you don't see? Okay, the one that you see, you're obeying. How is it benefiting you? That man that is standing in front of you, that you've worked all your life, suffered, labored under him. How is it benefiting you? It just takes one mistake for them to change and turn against you. What is it? What is the reason that causes us as human beings from the beginning of time that is causing us to not Obey God. Sin, of course. That's one. Sin. And then the another one is the fear of man. The fear of man. We are afraid of what people think. Saul was rejected by God. You understand? Because he was afraid of the people that he was leading. Mind you, God has chosen him to be the leader. And given him instruction, not the people, oh, him as a leader. And then he said, oh, the people. I didn't do it. Me, Saul, I didn't do it. The people. He said, that in another version, he said, I was afraid of the people. The fear of man can cause you 
to go against God's word. The fear of man can cause you to disobey God. And when you find yourself in that position, my brother and sister, we must repent. Should I now fear man and not God that has called me? May it never be your portion in Jesus' name. Some people are afraid. They are fear of man and the fear of rejection. What will people say? What will people say? If they reject me now, what will happen to me? I mean, after all, I'm not even seeing God. I see these people in front of me. So the ones that I see are the ones that I'm going to obey. At least it makes sense. I'm not going to obey somebody that I don't see. You're digging your own problem for yourself. You're digging your own problem for yourself. These people can give you what you want for today, but God gives you something that will last eternally until the day you meet Jesus. So it's better than... Is, obedience is better than sacrifice. And you have heard, obedience is better than sacrifice. So, in the book of Luke chapter 9 verse 22, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders, and the chief priests and scribes, and be slain, and to be raised on the third day. So if you are now here as a servant of God or as a child of God or just a normal person walking up and now God is speaking to you and you say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that because if I do that, they're going to reject me. They'll reject me. Jesus is saying, Jesus felt he went through rejection. People rejected him. The leaders rejected him. But that does not, did not allow him to not walk according to God's instruction. He walked faithfully in every area that God has called him. But after all, God was man. Yes, but there was a time that he walked here like you and I. The Bible said, for we do not have a high priest who does not have the compassion for what we go through. Because he walked here as a man, he understands, he feels our pain. So if we have to walk like Christ, we must have a Christ-like mindset. But if people reject me, God said he will pick me up. As long as you're standing for righteousness, God will pick you up. Another reason is lack of faith. Not trusting God enough. We don't, we don't obey God because we don't, we don't have faith. We don't obey him because we don't believe him at all. Without, without these things, it's very hard for us to walk in the promises of God. Please God first. In anything, please God first. Let God be first. In anything, please God first. Hallelujah. Please God first. And then, number two, one of the reasons why we don't experience the, the, the blessings of God, we must be a giver. This is a topic where we are living now in this dispensation of this time. It's very difficult for people to be a blessing to others. It's very good to bless in the times of convenience and abundance. It's good to, to give in the time when everything is going well and everything is, is fine and dandy. You understand? But remember that blessed is the one who gives than the one that receives. You must be a giver. And Jesus said, when you give, you must give in secret. You must give in secret. Okay, must I, give it, must I always give in secret? No. The reason why we give, you're not giving, you know, because you want people to clap for you and shout for you. And just put your name on, on plaque or on newspaper. No. You're giving because it's a commandment from God. The more you give, the more you receive. And the more you are blessed. Because he said, blessed are the ones who give. You know, nowadays, it's, it's, especially in this coronavirus, it's very easy for people to just give and post it everywhere. Jesus said, when, you, when you're giving to the poor, let's, let's go to the scripture. So it won't look like as if. I am just reading this so that I'm not making anybody feel some kind of way. You understand? Giving is very important, but we have to also be in that place. Ask God, how do I give? We must be cheerful givers. Give cheerfully. Don't give out of grumbling, complaining. Don't give because you feel like you're better than the one you're helping. Those kind of things. It was, that's why you see people say, I'm a giver. I always give. I always help people. But my situation never changes. Things are always the same because you are giving to get attention. You are giving for people to applaud you. You are giving because you want to get the reward back now. No. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 6. 
Matthew chapter 6. Let's go to the scripture, verse 1 to 4. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. It says, be careful. Do not practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And verse 2, it says, so when you give to the needy, the poor, the homeless, the orphans, the, the widows. When you give to these people, do not announce it with trumpets. Do not announce it with trumpets. As a Christian, as a leader, as a pastor, as a, as a worker, you know, when you feel led to give, give. You don't even want nobody to know. You don't even want others to know that you've given. These are the ways that God can bless you. These are the ways you can get reward from heaven and from your father. You understand? Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't do like the hypocrite do in the synagogues, the synagogues like in the church and on the street to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. The hypocrites and the and, and, and the, 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 the give in, in the in the open scene. Oh, here come, capture this. I'm, look, I'm giving this now. Please take this, let's put it on social media so everybody knows I'm doing this. There is, there is a time that is called for that. Like maybe charity organizations, they need funds, they can do fundraisings. That's a different story. But you, you know your motive that you're giving in. You're giving in so people can know that, oh, <laughs> I'm doing well. Or, I'm helping people. I mean, look at me. I, 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 God has elevated me. It's true. But the attitude in which you give that God does not like. It is the attitude in which you give that does not bring back blessing or reward. The praises and the applaud and accolade that you get from men on here, that's your only reward, Jesus said. And verse 3, it said, Jesus says, but when you give to the needy, when you give to the poor, do not let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Your father, what is who has seen the things you are doing under the table? People don't know. When you receive your paycheck, you said, okay, out of this three five hundred dollars I'm taking $50. I'm going to buy six bags of rice in Africa and help people. Out of this $100, my neighbor over here, um, I see the husband is not really working that much. I'll give them $100 for the kids to buy food. Nobody knew. When you do that way, when you're blessing and giving people that way, as a child of God, then you start seeing your reward. But the moment you give, oh my God, you are now sounding neat. Everybody, in fact, all the cameraman put it on newspaper. Go make sure everybody know I've given all. Oh, mm. The only reward you get is the one you get here. Jesus, it's not my word, it's Jesus that said it. Is a reward. So be a giver. You understand? Be a giver. Be a giver. Give in cheerful attitude. Give in cheerful attitude. Give in, in, in the spirit of love. When you give, you have to feel good about it. Happy. When I give, I feel good. Oh, I am so thankful that God put me in this position to be a blessing unto my neighbor. God, I thank you for providing for me. Even though it wasn't enough, but God, I thank you that I was able to give them just because just when I saw those children getting happy that they're going to have cereal in the house and milk, Lord, that makes me happy. Oh, the reward that comes from God in that giving, you yourself will not understand it. You should give without expecting credit. Don't give because you want people to... Can you imagine? We used to do that. There was a time like when we used to um, help our families back home. When you send money back home, for some of you who are Africans, some of them will never call you. They will not call you for nobody to say thank you. I, that thing used to bother me. Eh? How come they don't call and say thank you? Do they know how much people work in this country? But you see, as Christians, that's not how we should do. Give without expecting anything back. Give without expecting them to, to, to pay you back. Just give out of cheerful heart. 
give from the ones not from the leftover like let's say you ate you cook rice yesterday the one that is left because you don't want it now okay let me think about my neighbor no that same moment when you cook you're dishing for you and your family dish from them from that same place and give it to them you understand give when they ask you don't tell your neighbor go and come back tomorrow when you have it give when they ask you you understand everything belongs to god you are giving because you are acknowledging that it is god who has provided for you yourself so in this moment you don't have much everybody the whole world is on financial shutdown but a little that you have like the woman in elijah the widow she didn't have that much but a little she said i was planning to eat this my son and i so we can die after eating this because this is the last food for the day and Elisha said, bring what you have. She brought it out. And immediately, it was multiplied. So when we give in this manner, without making sound, if you are that kind of person that used to give people and announce it and gossip about them, some of you, you have. But people are afraid to come and ask you for help because they are afraid that you will go and announce their name. The ones that come to ask you is because they have laid pride and shame aside to ask you because they have no more options. I'd rather go and beg him or her. Even though I know she's going to talk about it. She's going to announce it. I would rather put my shame and my respect and dignity aside. Just so I have something. So some people that come to ask you for help. It's not because really they want to come ask you. It's because they, they rather choose life over dying. You know, and put their pride aside. And their dignity aside. It shouldn't be that way. You have stripped that person from everything just so they can have bread from you. It shouldn't be that way. As a Christian, we should ask, where is the need for me to help? Where do I see need to help? In our neighborhood, in our, even in our own churches. We should walk with the mentality of givers. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. That was the biggest gift that was given unto us as humans. So, Let's learn to give generously. Give in love, generously, without expecting nothing back. Oh, but I'm the one that always helps. It is okay. The Bible said, Jesus said, and the Father in heaven that sees who has been given in the secret without letting the right hand know, he will reward you openly. Keep giving. Just keep giving. Amen? And point number three. Forgiveness. We must forgive. Forgive. It is very important. We are not forgiving because of, you know, that person. I don't, you know, sometimes people will say, okay, I don't want to forgive that person because if I forgive them, then it's going to make it seem like what they did to me was. It's not for them, it's for you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their sins and their trespasses, their heart, you understand? Then your heavenly father will forgive you. If you forgive your father who has abused you since you were a little girl, you forgive that husband who has divorced you and left you. After everything you have worked together, they left you so they can be with another woman and enjoy the things you labored for. Forgive him. You forgive that friend who has disappointed you, who has betrayed you. Forgive that church who has hurt you. That pastor, he's human too. She's human too. Forgive him. Uh -huh. And then what happens when we do that? Verse 15. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Neither. So it's very important to God for us to be uh, people who forgive, because when you forgive, you are the one that, that, that is at the advantage. In other words, you, you live in good health. Forgive, unforgiveness is like you drinking soda. Caustic, uh, uh, soda in America is drink. In Africa, soda is like uh, caustic soda. It's like what we used to wash clothes. It's not good for consumption. So it's like poison. You understand? So when you hold unforgiveness in your heart for somebody, it's like you drinking that poison and you're sitting in your living room. Oh, 
God, as I drink this poison, may that person that I have unforgiveness, let them, let them receive the, the effect of this poison that I'm drinking. Oh, my brother and sister, it doesn't work like that. It is you that will die. It is you that will be hurt. The more you do that, the more you're hurting. Maybe that person does not even know you have unforgiveness against them. You understand? But also you as a child of God, every day when you pray, Father, open my eyes. Open my understanding in every area that I have unforgiveness against my brother and my sister. Show me hidden secrets in my heart. Father, reveal my heart to me that I can see the things that I have against my fellow brother, my fellow sister, my mother, my father, my husband, my children. Help me so I can forgive them. Because there are times actually you don't even know you have, unforg you have unforgiveness in your heart for people because there is some hurt. It's been so long. You don't even think that um, you still have that unforgiveness inside so that's why when you pray you say such within me and show me things that need to be getting to to get rid of unforgiveness is not a good thing it blocks is your blessing it does not give you access that's why sometimes when you come before god to pray you feel like every time you pray there's a big wall like you don't see the wall but you feel like your prayers are bouncing and coming back that's why sometimes people don't even bother to spend time with God. But anyway, every time I go to pray, it seems like I'm just praying. My prayers are coming back. Sit and search within yourself. Is there unforgiveness? Things are not working out for me. I'm not even enjoying this Christianity. Is there unforgiveness? Back in the Old Testament, when someone have quarrel or have issues with each other, they said, before you come and put your sacrifices on the altar, lay them down. Go make peace before you come back and give that sacrifice. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 22. 21 says, Then Peter came to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Peter is asking Jesus Christ, Jesus, wait a minute. I mean, I know we are all following you here and you are a good man. Jesus, you are a good man. You have a good heart. I've seen people you, who have hurt you and you still, you hang around with them as if nothing happened. Jesus God, come on, tell me, I'm just human. How many times, Jesus, will somebody hurt me? Should I forgive? Seven times? And this is Jesus' response. Jesus said unto, unto him, Peter, I say not unto thee until seventy times, seven times seven, but until seventy times seven. So, Jesus told Peter, no, 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 boy, come here, sit down. You see, in this life, forgiveness is part of the journey. Like every day when you need food to eat, to sustain you, and keep you going and give you strength, forgiveness is also part of what you need to be able to get to where you need to be. Because you see, Peter, when you leave this place right now and go down the market, someone is going to say something to you that will hurt you. But Peter, forgive. Let it fall off. If you truly want to follow me, let it fall off. Don't forgive them seven times. He said, well, 70 times seven. It's not the mathematical equation that is in question here. It's just telling us that it's a lifestyle. Forgiveness should be a lifestyle. I struggled with unforgiveness for years. Because there was some pain that will happen in your life. You will even forget about the definition of forgiveness. You will even forget that the, the Bible mentioned about us forgiving each other. Some pain are so deep, it takes the blood of Jesus to heal it. I tell you out of experience. And one thing about unforgiveness, it never allows you to pray for the ones who have hurt you. Okay? Every time you think about the one that have hurt you, you think evil about them. You think evil about them. It never allows you to think anything positive about that person. It could be your mother. I have a friend who and her, her mother and her have been like cat and dog. Unforgiveness. It is not a good thing. It's a bad, it's a bad seed. If there's a family that works in unforgiveness, it, that family will never prosper. There will never be peace. And if care is not taken, it will go from generation to generation, to generation. And if you look deep down spiritually, that family was designed to be blessed families. 
They are probably people that God has put together for evangelism. They are people who God has put together to heal and mend broken souls. But you see, when we hold unforgiveness against each other, it blocks our blessings. God will not answer your prayer. God, I mean, if God holds unforgiveness against you, you are finished. If God does not forgive you, you are done. Case closed. Just go home. Jesus said if we don't forget, forgive our brothers who have hurt us, then God himself will not forgive you. Ah, that's a bad place to be. When God said, I will not forgive you, my brother, run away. Look for the people who have hurt you, who you have hurt. Ask them for forgiveness and you too forgive them because you don't want God to hold unforgiveness against you. Amen. Matthew um, chapter, six, chapter 6 verse 15. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you. Again, he said it in the book of Matthew. So please, it's very important that we forgive. You that pastor that has unforgiveness against the next pastor, for no reason. Maybe because one member used to go to your church and now the member crossed the street. Just crossed the street and went to the other church. Now you're not talking to that pastor. Is it your life? It is God's property. Forgive all. You will give account one day. Forgive. Hey. Forgive. Please forgive. Members, forgive your pastors. Husbands, forgive your wives. Wives, forgive your husbands. Children, forgive your parents. Sisters, forgive your brothers. Forgiveness is all we need. Please, forgive. And one last point for the day is faith. Have faith. The last point for the day. Have faith. Have faith. According to Hebrews chapter one, verse, chapter eleven, verse one, without well, let me say, like, first of all, faith. You say, what is faith? Hebrews chapter one, verse, uh, that, chapter eleven, verse one. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That thing that you are praying to God for, child, you're praying to God for a child, is the thing that you're hoping for. That's faith. When you read the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You're hoping for a marriage. You're hoping for a home. You're hoping for salvation. You're hoping for a child. You're hoping for a job. Hoping for education. You're hoping for just doors to open. And the evidence has not yet been seen. But yet you hope. You understand? Hope. The substance of the things that you're hoping for. And though the evidence is not there yet, but you're still hoping. That's faith. Substance of things hoped for and the evidence that are not yet seen. That is faith. The husband has not come yet. You're looking for your wedding gown. That's faith. Husband is not here yet. You are inquiring about houses. You are inquiring about event planners. Inquiring about where your wedding should take place. That's faith. There's nothing wrong with that. You're walking in faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are walking in faith. When you're doing this, you walk in faith. Anything you trusted in God for, you just take the step. Having faith and believing in God that it will happen. Leave the rest to God. It is the faith that God sees. The action, the faith. Abraham was one of the people that God loved so much. Because of his faith. God said, Abraham, I know you've been waiting for this promise for so long. But I want you to take this seed that I've given you. You've waited for so long. Take him to this place and go sacrifice him. Faith. It takes faith for man to do that. Hallelujah. It takes the faith of God for Abraham to take the seed that he has waited for for all his life. And take him to this place where he can sacrifice his son. Amen. Now, verse, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed, by, formed at God's command. So that what is seen 
was not made out of what was visible. So basically, what God made, he made out of faith. By faith, God brought the visibility out of nothing. What we're seeing now, it never existed. The earth was without, was without void, but by faith, God called it forth. Let there be, and there was. Amen. Faith. Verse 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel, Abel speak, still speaks even though he's dead. Even when the man was dead, because of the faith in which he sold and he gave his offering, Rekatosa, the way he gave his offering unto God, by faith his blood was speaking for him, even when he was dead. Faith. By faith, verse 5, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commanded as one who pleased God. And verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, that what he re and, and, and that he reward those who honestly, diligently seek him. Huh. Without faith, markets are makeable. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is the faith that God is looking for. Jesus said, I don't need you to have faith like Abraham. Abraham started somewhere. Abraham did not come from a family that were godly. But because of the little faith that he had like a mustard seed, God used that to do great things in his life. And because of that, you and I are the seeds and the generations of Abraham. Faith. Is what we need. When you have faith, you will work and see the generous blessings of God. When we have faith, we will start to walk in the power of God. What are the things that faith do? Why do we need faith? Well, if you want to be that person who can knock on heaven's door and the doors of heaven will open, you need faith. Without faith, you can't please God. You can't touch heaven's door. Your prayer will just be bouncing up like this. But you, when you have faith, your prayer shoots up and passes up over the demon's kingdom and then enter the heaven. Hallelujah. We need faith. Jesus says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, be thou removed and it shall be moved and taken into the sea. Anything that you do with faith, you will see the result. You must have faith. The Bible said in chapter 2, in, in chapter 11, verse 2, Hebrews, he said, for by faith, the elders were able to obtain result. That's why we're in ministry. You have, you have been in this ministry for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You know, someone that just started yesterday is shooting up. It's not that they went to Baba Lao. It's because the faith is the driven force. Behind the ministry. And when you have faith, the Lord is enabling you. The Holy Spirit is, is pushing you. Is, is, is your anchor. Is the one that is coming in this race with you with faith. But when you're doing things by yourself. Oh God, I don't need you today. I can do this. I mean, look at how many people I have in my church. I don't need you. I have able men. I have carpenters. I have, when the church needs fixing, they can fix it. I don't need you. Ten years, you're still sitting there. This person that just came yesterday. He's above. It's not competition, but obedience and faith is leading him where God wants him to be. So if you want to be that person who shakes heaven, you must have faith. If you want to be that person that pleases God, you must have faith. Hey, if you want to be that person that wants to be a man after God's heart, you must have faith. Without this, we cannot survive as Christians. Without this, we cannot please God. Without this, our Christian life work will just be nothing before God. You don't want to be that person that will die. And Jesus said, who are you? Oh, but God, I used to have 20,000 membership. Jesus said, I didn't know you. Where were you again? What's your address? What town were you located? Oh, I didn't see you. I'm sorry. Get out of my presence. May that never be your portion in Jesus' name. We've read and see that by faith, Enoch was taken in heaven. 
straight from this earth to heaven. Why? Because he had faith. He didn't experience that. And he pleased God. What is the power of faith? Why do we need faith? What can faith do in our lives when you're a Christian, when you're a child of God? What do you do when you have faith? Or what is the benefit of faith? Point number one, when you have faith, it can subdue kingdoms. This is the word of God in the book of Hebrews. The man of God in the Bible, Moses, he subdued a kingdom. He subdued a whole nation. Hallelujah. Faith can have you subdue a kingdom. You can bring righteousness through faith by God using you and helping you. Righteousness will come by faith. Your walk with God will be enjoyable. You will love walking with God. And you can stop the mouth of lions just like Daniel. I pray today that as this word has come that the Lord is using this to be a blessing to somebody Remember the points that I have given today. One, obey the word of God. Hallelujah. Two, be a giver. Three, have faith. Hallelujah. Have faith. In everything that you do, you need faith. Obey the word of God. Be a giver. Forgive others. And have faith. May God help you. May God bless us all. May God strengthen us all. This is not the time for us to be playing church. Hallelujah. There's going to come time if we don't make use of this time that we have now. You say, what did I do in the days that I was home not doing nothing? Create time where you will spend time with God. Encourage your children to be able to spend time with God. Fathers, Rise up in your homes. You are the leader. The Bible said that the man is the head of the home. As Christ is the head of the church. Rise up men in your home. Women, go on your knees. You are like Deborah's. Pray for your children. You are raising the next generation. Don't raise them with emptiness. Raise them to be filled with the spirit and the power of God in this season. Father, we just want to thank you for this moment. Adonai, I give you praise and I give you honor. Thank you, Jesus, for this message that has come for today. And Lord, I pray for your people who are watching this ministry, O oh God. That all these messages and this point that have been given, God, that they will put into consideration. And God, not only listen, but they will be doers in the name of Jesus. God, that they will apply every word that has been spoken here tonight. That it will enable them and enlighten them and trigger something inside of them. For them to run with the passion and the vision that God has given them. Jesus, I pray for every man around the globe. To be the leaders in their homes and bring their children to Christ and their spouse. Father, let righteousness and godliness be on the rise in this time. Father, may we never go back in our old ways of doing things, O oh God. Let the fire and the anointing of God rest upon the church. And I pray for the vision that you showed me about those pastors, O oh God, who are coming to, um, to this conference that you called. Lord, let there be a renewing of minds in the, in the leaders and the shepherds that you've chosen. Work on their hearts and their minds, O oh God, to forgive each other. Every man of God and every pastor right now, O oh God, who is in conflict with each other, Father, let there be peace in the name of Jesus. Restore the church and restore their homes. Restore every Christian marriage around the world, O oh God, that is suffering at this moment, O oh God, that there shall be peace, unity. You said that what God has put together, let no man put asunder in the name of Jesus. Help our children, O oh God, children who are being locked down in their homes and being abused. Father, you be their help in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you for those who are searching for answers, O oh God. And that answer is you that they are looking for. Father, may you meet them in the point of their needs. May a lot of people find comfort, O oh God, in this season. I pray for the peace of the Lord that passes all understanding to rest upon them in the name of Jesus. Someone, O oh God, right now that is in need of financial help, O oh God, may they receive that help in the name of Jesus. Supply their needs, O oh God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, King of Glory. 
Thank you for all the people who are partnering with this ministry. Thank you for Gideon Mission TV, oh God, in Nigeria. Lord, that you will continue to use them to do great exploit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If you're here for the first time, you've never accepted Christ, and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you this opportunity to do so. Or maybe you have walked with Christ before and things have caused you. This worldly pressure has led you away from him. I want you to rededicate your life back. I ask if you want to rededicate, this is the perfect opportunity to do it. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for coming to die for me. I am sorry for all these years that I have not believed in you. I'm sorry for turning my back on you. Jesus, I know that you are who you say you are. And I believe that you died and you went on that cross and died and gave your life for me. I confess with my mouth, Jesus, that you are the Lord. And you are the Son of God. And I believe in my heart that you died for me. Jesus, this moment I invite you into my life. Come into my life. Make me your friend and my, my temple your dwelling place. And take everything that the world has given me away and fill my life with the precious gift of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name. If you just say that prayer, I welcome you into the kingdom of God, into the body, in the family of Christ. Find a church where you can be going to, to pray, feed you with word, and most importantly, personally make time. Personally, make time to strengthen your relationship with Christ. Personally, make time for Christ. When you're at home, read the word. And everything that you read in that Bible, believe that it is what God said it is. And apply it. If the Bible said, thou shalt not lie, practice not to lie. Apply and obey God's word. By doing so, you will see the fruit of God's righteousness for your life. God bless you all. And God continue to keep you. God continue to restore this nations all over the world. May the globe be united and the love of God will spread throughout. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And just a little bit of an ad here. If you want this outfit that I'm wearing, I encourage you to um, follow Deja's Touch on Facebook. He, she is very, very good at what she's doing. And we're here, Kingdom Promoters, to just be able to encourage young entrepreneurs to be able to do what God is, the gift and the talent that God has given them to do what they do best in Jesus' name. So my wardrobe is coming from DJ's Touch. God bless you all. Goodbye. Here, yes, Simon. Come put this.